So we want to just jump in. So a lot of people here might know about Blackboard, but they don't know about you. How did you guys get to know each other? And what was it that made you embark on this terrifying journey in the beginning that you call Blackboard? Kick off. Uh, so Matt and I were actually roommates uh, in college at American University. We were in uh, the same fraternity. We ended up uh, rooming together in the dorms and later in a larger uh, group house. And uh, you know, it was actually interesting because uh, even back then in college, I think we were both very entrepreneurial. So we'd often sit around talking about uh, different business ideas to uh, start or different things that we, we might do upon graduation. And even though uh, when Matt graduated, he went on and got his uh, a master's in education from Harvard. I went on and got my MBA from Georgetown. We uh, stayed in touch and then ended up reconnecting after graduate school. and. Uh, ended up both working at KPMG Pete Marwick in their higher ed technology consulting group, which then led us to starting Blackboard. So you knew that you were going to do something entrepreneurial, but did you know that you would do it with each other? Well, I think we were always like the first ones that we would call if we had ideas, and Mike had the first idea around electronic admissions, which is how we ended up working together at KPMG. Uh, but yeah, Mike has a computer science background, I have an education background, and all of our ideas, when you're students, the things you think of are the things related to education, because that's all you know. Uh, so all of our ideas kind of revolved around that area. So sometimes we have some entrepreneurs here. Sometimes people think you have to have this big, grand idea and know that it's going to be some you know, $100 million opportunity. But when I talk with you about how, dream, how Blackboard, sorry, Freudian slip, <laughs> how, how Blackboard started, it seemed a lot more organic, intentional, but organic. Tell, tell us about how you saw and ascertained the market opportunity. Yeah, well, first off, I do think Dreambox is going to be bigger than Blackboard, so, uh, so keep at it. Uh, my kids use Dreambox, so I'm a, I'm a huge fan. Um, so it was somewhat incremental. There was no, you know, I wrote a blog post and I said there was no spider bite yeah. moment for those who know kind of Genesis story of, of Spider-Man. But uh, we were working at KPMG. We're setting up administrative systems for universities. So things like today, a Lucy and PeopleSoft Workday. And it just seemed odd that universities were spending millions and millions of dollars on administrative computing. They were investing in networking their residence halls. Uh, back then, it was called a port per pillow, uh, was the goal. This was before Wi-Fi. And there was no software to make any of that useful for teaching and learning. And yet, the front office of education is teaching and learning. So we felt like we could imagine, what would a class website look like? What would you want to be able to do? Hand in assignments, take quizzes online, have discussion boards, get the most recent version of the syllabus. So this wasn't a grand vision around e-learning per se. It really was, how do you make the life of a professor who doesn't know how to program HTML, I choke up when I, when I think about it, <laughs> um, who doesn't know how to program HTML and make it obscenely easy to create a course website? Um, that was really the basic idea. And then once we were there and talking to faculty, talking to universities, we began to see a glimpse of full distance learning uh, through the internet. We began to, the flip classroom, a lot of the themes we take for granted mm -hmm. today, you could begin to see how just dropping that one pebble in the pond could create those ripple effects over time. So when did you start thinking about the business? So you talked about the problem in the marketplace. You talked about the inefficiency of the marketplace. But at some point, you sat down and said, we got to create a business and go get some money. Uh, so we were literally working at KPMG Pete Marwick. I was nearing my one-year anniversary of working there. Um, Matt had taken the time and started to be thoughtful about writing a full business plan of what he thought was going to happen in the industry and how people were going to adopt online learning and even came up with the name Blackboard. And I think we were just so motivated to do something entrepreneurial, we were like all excited and ready to quit. But I, I said, we, we, we can't quit for a week because I definitely got to hit my like one year anniversary. <laughs> so I have like at least one year work experience on my resume just in case this doesn't work out. So we basically sat around for a week uh, and then uh, quit two days after my uh, one year anniversary. And literally, um, during our lunch breaks at KPMG, we were just walking around the neighborhood looking for uh, you know, an, an office, a place where we can uh, hang a shingle. We found a uh, a small brownstone that had Seen two that. rooms available. Yeah. And uh, so we literally left uh, work one day, and then the next day showed up one block away working at this small little brownstone around the corner. So we famously stole the chairs from KPMG. Uh, <laughs> uh, we borrowed the computers. We did return the computers. But <laughs> chairs are very expensive. Uh, when you're starting a company, that's you know, the most expensive part. But w the way we, we got going, which is a way a lot of companies get going, is um, 
do a consulting contract. Mm -hmm. So the beginning was, let's work with a group of universities that want a learning management system. Back then, we called it a course management system. Um, and we would build theirs. And this was part of the IMS standards project. And I won't go too, too deep into it. But it gave us the consulting revenues to kind of set up shop. And then we ran into the thing that anyone who starts a business through consulting runs into, which is you never get to the product because the consulting right. client ends up monopolizing all your time and any resources you have, you want to put back into that. Um, and then the way we, we broke out of that was a year later, uh, came across the Course Info team at right. Cornell and were able to team up. And I think that's in many ways, while this is the 20th anniversary, June 97, it's June 98, when we partnered with uh, the Course Info team, and I think that's sort of the modern Blackboard. So some people, when they think about trying to emulate what you guys do, they, they think they have to have everything planned out. But as I hear about your story from the beginning, so much of it was kind of planned happenstance. Like, did you, did you say, we need to get a lot of talent, and let's go look for partners who have talent so we can scale this thing, or did it just kind of fall into place? Well, look, I, I, I think, um, uh, we, we both, uh, Ben and Fred from as well as a little bit detrimental. When we started Blackboard, it was just before the big dot-com boom had hit mm -hmm. the East Coast. So when we actually quit our jobs to uh, do our own startup, it was still actually stupid to do that. In fact, <laughs> I remember I actually was getting yeah. married uh, the exact month I quit my job. So if you can imagine oh, how this conversation, goodness. when I went home and I said to my fiance, I said, Randy, uh, oh, my God. Um, you know that high-paying job I have at KPMG? <laughs> um, it's gone. You know my... <laughs> old roommate from college that I get around a lot so with. Good to feel like uh, <laughs> here's an idea. Um, I'm going to quit my job the month we're getting married. Don't worry, it'll be fine. So, um, you know, and this was before everyone was suddenly doing their own startup. So I actually think that we benefited from that because, no, the, the, the business plan and the foresight that Matt had on what was going to happen in the education industry, uh, we ended up holding to that model the whole time. Mm. We, we had this idea that universities were going to use the internet to bring teaching and learning online. And so, I mean, certainly along the way, we, we took you know, a little bit of turns and, and tried mm -hmm. to figure out the direction, but I think we always actually had that as the guiding North principle mm -hmm. that we were headed towards, and we mm -hmm. kept going in that direction. We, we didn't pivot our business plan. We didn't even actually know what that was. So we were always very focused on achieving that goal, and, and I actually think it was that focus is what enabled us to end up being <laughs> successful in the long run. That's interesting. So talk to us about how you decided how much money you need it. So you guys did, you, do, you dove in, you did something that no one else did. How did you know how much you needed the first time you went out for money? Um, so uh, it, it, it's, it's a great story. So we, uh, we started speaking to, of course, we didn't even actually know about raising money. Again, this is kind of before the dot-com yeah. bubble hit these coasts. You know, one day a friend of ours came and said, oh, hey, I'm going to this event where you can go and you can pitch your business plans. And we said, oh, we should tag along. We probably... That wasn't GSV. No, no, no. <laughs> this, this wasn't a place yet. <laughs> And um, so then we started uh, going out there and trying to speak to angel investors, people mm -hmm. that might uh, be interested in, in giving us money. And, and we, we kind of had a lead. There was a, a gentleman named Ching Ho Fung that had just sold his business and made some money. And was in, we heard he was interested in education. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we began talking with him. Then we maybe stalked him a little bit and eventually <laughs> found out he was going to be in the mall one day. We went to the mall to try to just like accidentally run into him. And is eventually, that true? is that a true story? Oh yeah, this was like when cell phones were just starting to become popular. We didn't fully appreciate that he could see who was calling constantly. Um, <laughs> so the number of times in our phone number. So we tracked him down to a McDonald's at Tyson's Mall, and he ended up investing uh, a quarter of what we had originally talked to him about because he had basically given us a no. And then we coincidentally <laughs> ran into him. He invested uh, a quarter Two, of the capital 000. at like half the valuation wow. that we had previously agreed to him. So the amount of money we raised is the amount of money we could raise. Yeah. And then it was, what's the art of the possible with that money? With that money? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. OK, so let's talk about valuation a little bit. So at what point were you starting to think about valuation? So you got a little money to, to get some initial work done. And then you knew you were going to start building product. I know you, Michael, you wanted to build a big product. How did you? Well, uh, so the valuation story is, 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 is a great one. We, um, so we had raised, we ended up raising about $400,000 in angel money. Uh, so this is in the first two years? No, year? within, within the first, about nine months in okay. about, we had raised, raised $400,000. Mm -hmm. 
And now uh, we use that money to combine with Course Info, and suddenly we had a couple of clients. We had yeah. this consulting contract. Yeah. We're gaining real momentum. We were uh, at, at this uh, uh, um, uh, 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 venture capital uh, pitch, Summit. and mm -hmm. um, we uh, had been speaking with a, a, a local venture capital from Novak Biddle for a while, and they had seen the progress we were making. They were interested, so we started talking to them about valuation and, and maybe investing in the round. And, Instead of engaging in a conversation with us, uh, this is a little date how old this story is, they faxed us a picture. <laughs> so we, our fax was off, and it gets a picture. So they, didn't, they don't say anything. They just fax us one photo, and it was from a comic strip called The VC, where the VC is just throwing a dart at a dartboard, and it hits $3 million as the pre-money valuation. <laughs> they literally just faxed that to us. And uh, give or take the 100 grand, that ended up being our valuation for the first yeah, round. Every Series B was $3 million. Whatever you were, whatever you did, whatever your metrics. So we appreciated their transparency. That's interesting. Uh, did their process. So a lot of folks at this conference um, are kind of taken by this notion of freemium. Um, get as many eyeballs as you can, give your thing away for free, and worry about monetizing your business later on. Did you guys give Blackboard away for free in the beginning? And if so, how did you get convince people who were getting it for free to ultimately move to pay? Yeah, I would say not really. Um, and I don't believe in, well, first off, there's a lot of different business models in education. You could be working with the parents, you know, outside the school versus the school itself. But if, you're, if your client is the school or university, I really don't believe in giving it away free. Universities value what they pay for. And nine out of 10 times when you're asked to do a pilot or a project and give it away, and then will be a reference, it doesn't pan out. Again, because they didn't pay for it, they're not invested. Uh, in it, so it's not just from a viability perspective; it's just a commitment, because the to win the not just winning the battle of the adoption, but the war of getting that really excited, referenceable relationship. You need them to pay. Mm -hmm. You need them to be invested. Mm -hmm. But what we did that was close to it, although we did it for a different reason, is we put uh, we had Blackboard.com, so any faculty member around the world could come to Blackboard.com, create a course website and it would be in isolation of any other faculty, any of the university services like SIS integration mm -hmm. or single sign-on. Um, but, but they could get an experience of how easy it was. And then when there were enough faculty doing it, that would tell our sales team, this is a university to visit and say, hey, why do you have all your faculty on blackboard.com? Um, you know, why don't you set up your own server? Again, this was back in the days of on-premise software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Set up your own server it's a much better experience and we'd be off to the mm -hmm. races. So we gave them a way to try it, mm -hmm. but it wasn't free to grab market share. It really was just a way of socializing the concept of what, of what we were doing. But, but I also think this is also where we benefited from just being such a, uh, an early uh, company. The, the whole freemium business model really was just developing. So yeah. when we put together our business model, we said, hey, we built this software, let's charge an annual subscription mm -hmm. for it so we can have it as a lower price, mm -hmm. but a constant relationship with the clients that they pay us every year. And that was just the, the model that we were, we were focused on. And then I remember, you know, not more than a, a year or two later, suddenly there was this big press release. We were the main e-learning system in the marketplace, us and WebCT, mm -hmm. we were the, 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 the two uh, startups that were gaining a lot of traction. We each had maybe 300 or so clients. Mm -hmm. And suddenly an announcement came out, said, uh, Campus Pipeline, 400 universities using their technology. And we had never even run into them in one bake-off. We had never even heard of them. And suddenly this press release comes out that they have 400 Huge. clients. And they listed Georgetown University as one of the clients, which was right one next of door. our clients. Yes. So we called up Georgetown. We said, you're, you're using this brand new uh, uh, platform. Uh, this new client they said, oh, no, no. They, uh, they just told us that they were going to send us their software for free. They FedExed us a couple of CDs. We haven't installed it. So they really had just FedExed a bunch of CDs to 400 to universities, get. counted all of them as clients. And, uh, but, but that didn't end up translating to you know, any, any real revenue for them. So, um, so you weren't tempted. We, yeah, I you mean, knew I the real we, story. I think we were able to, to, to stay until what Matt said, look, if you're providing value, then that's worth something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so that's how we, we built our uh, annual subscription mm -hmm. base. So we skipped over one, one piece I wanted to ask about. So oftentimes entrepreneurs are really pressured to know when do you make the huge investment, fixed cost investment, in a sales force. So Matt, you just referenced you already had a sales force when I asked the freemium, but at what point did you decide that you're going to take a big chunk of money 
and hire salespeople. I think that was actually always uh, one of the reasons why Blackboard was successful in growing as a company. We were very sales focused. Yeah. I remember we, we had two sales guys. And I, I had went to them and said, oh, hey, you know, we have two guys. One was kind of covering the East Coast, one was the West Coast. I'm like, we're going to hire two more. They said, no, no, we got to cover it. We got one guy in the East Coast, <laughs> one guy in the West Coast. We're each only bringing in half a million dollars. Yeah. There's no more business out there. Just to, we ended up hiring two more guys. So suddenly we had someone covering the East Coast, the West Coast, and the you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, 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 um, uh, North and South. And, and, and then, of course, they were all bringing in also about a half a million dollars. And we said, hey, I think we're going to double the sales force from 48 people. Said, no, we got it covered. We already got a guy covering the north, east, south, and west. We're fine. We have the full US covered with just the four of us. But every time we would increase the size of the sales force, that meant more people on the yeah. street, talking to clients more, being engaged in the community, and that ended up yielding more sales. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, we had a sales force of 400 plus mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you also, your, your model for your license actually, I think, also spurred adoption. I mean, like, you weren't counting seats, individuals. Right. You were basically mm -hmm. like, I don't, I don't care how many people are on it. I want as many people on it as possible. It's like a, a revised freemium. It's just like from the individual student, you didn't care how many people were on it, right? No, that's right. I mean, our, our whole focus was individual faculty on Blackboard.com. Uh, a very inexpensive $5,000 a year server, which was the Course Info server for like a department, because mm -hmm. we knew very few universities were ready to make an enterprise-wide commitment, and then the higher priced annual subscription. I would describe it a little differently. Well, first off, one of the areas that Mike and I constantly debated was that. So every budget, you know, more salespeople, and then I had some product. New, new thing yeah. in product that I wanted to do. That never happened. So I will go on record <laughs> in saying he was probably right. Um, <laughs> But I think the ease of use of the product also was a big part of sort of what drove adoption that, you know, that then created mm -hmm. the conditions for the sales reps. Um, but uh, the way we got into the annual subscription was most everything that we did right was because we did something wrong. Um, so we assumed that this was going to be like PeopleSoft, but for the front office. So we went out and asked for you know, four hundred, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars for a course management system. And we said, you're spending two million dollars to do finance. This is the thing that every <laughs> faculty member and student right. is going to experience. This is your teaching and learning yeah. process. How would you not pay us four to five hundred thousand dollars? But nobody would. And then one day, <laughs> someone said, but you know, if you just charged us twenty thousand or thirty thousand dollars a year, we could put it in our operating budget and not think twice about it. And so it was our failure with a perpetual license model mm -hmm. plus maintenance mm -hmm. that got us to the full kind of recurring. And, um, and, and back then, that annual subscription was very rare. So it looked like we weren't growing fast because everyone who had perpetual license models had all the revenue recognized up front. Ours was rateably recognized. Yep. And we had to tell them to look at the deferred revenue. When we went public, we were the probably the first or second software that company model. to go public with a recurring revenue. Salesforce went public later in the year, and we had to explain that to the street. But all of that we stumbled in. It created the perfect incentive because every year the value of our business was much more oriented on the existing customers, mm -hmm. renewing and growing, than it was incrementally adding anything on mm. top. When people think about Blackboard, they think about the impact to the learning environment oftentimes. When I think about Blackboard, I think about all of the things that you did that so many of us are replicating that maybe we don't even attribute to you. You know, the routable revenue model and how much you trained the investor set to understand what the dynamics were, what the success criteria were. So going back in the rearview mirror when you were going out for money when no one was really doing that model, how did you have the conversation with funders about how are you, how are you going to scale the business when it was so foreign to them? Yeah, so this was just before, you know, kind of SaaS had taken off, so people didn't understand. I mean, we really had to go around and explain, don't just look at the revenue, look right. at the deferred revenue, look at our yes. bookings, because even though we're having huge sales, it's getting smoothed out over it's 12 so months. So predictable, yeah. Yeah, so we were, we, were, we were explaining the benefits of predictable revenue stream, mm -hmm. but a very constant slow growth, mm -hmm. instead of the up and down, more volatile, perpetual licenses. Mm -hmm. And we had to educate the investor base on that uh, at the time. And you've invest, you've educated a lot of us. I mean, I'm, I'm a practitioner, definitely. Yeah. So when I talk to when you when people listen to you guys, you guys weave in and out of product and sales and marketing and investor, and oftentimes entrepreneurs think, okay, we have to set up our lanes. You're in the marketing lane. You're in the product lane. You're in the sales lane. Did you guys set up lanes? How did you decide what you were going to do? How were you going to divide and conquer? 
We had lanes between the two of us, which were generally, I would gnaw off my arm to not do the thing that he enjoys doing. Um, and he would pretty much do the same thing. So there was just like this natural gravitation to, I loved what I was doing, which was mostly spending time out with universities, engaging them around the product strategy and the product roadmap. Um, Mike loved the art of building the business and mm -hmm. certainly had a very big role in, uh, in, in shaping the product. In fact, a lot of our products started with Mike kind of doing demo air uh, on, uh, on his machine. So we had our lanes between each other, which is why I think, first of all, I would never start a company without a co-founder. I can't imagine doing it. It's definitely a team sport, and there's more co-founders than the two of us. There's a, a great collection of people, people like Andrew Rosen that's here and others uh, in the room. Um, but, uh, but no, I think we generally hired I mean, I think of you. I mean, we tried to hire athletes, people who could be fluent, talking education, talking product, also talking pricing and business. And that gave us a lot of versatility as we grew. We wanted to create a K-12 business. We could move someone in there. We wanted to shift higher ed from being the whole company to being a line of business, needed mm -hmm. someone to run it, international. Mm -hmm. And I think Mike in particular was very good at figuring out who were the athletes that had full stack skills and we, I don't think our heads of product were never deep technicians per se, you know, and our head of sales always had a decent kind of product head to yes. them. I don't know if you'd agree with that. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that describes it well. Can you scratch that a little bit? So when you, you guys had a pretty good footprint in higher ed, what was the catalyst for thinking about K-12 or corporate even before you began your aggressive acquisition strategy? Well, I think we thought of it even back in the beginning, even if we oh. didn't really operationalize against it until a little bit later, because we were talking about utilizing the internet to move teaching and learning online. And, and, and even though our initial focus was in higher education, because mm -hmm. they were the first uh, set of education institutions to come online and they had the money, we of course knew K through 12 corporate training international were all gonna be also big opportunities, even if we were starting in higher ed. Mm -hmm. So I think we always had that thought from the beginning. It just took us a little while to be able to kind of ramp up and focus in those to areas. Focus. So it wasn't pressure to maintain the incredible growth for, for you to... I mean, there was certainly an expectation that we'd continue to grow, but I would say we were kind of mission-oriented, and we could see students graduating... We could see students graduating out of higher ed having used Blackboard, and they're going to go into a workplace of learning, and that seemed natural to kind of follow that. Mm -hmm. And as well, students coming into higher ed, and to the extent that K-12 was going to adopt something, why not be on the system where you mm -hmm. develop that literacy? Mm -hmm. As well, you know, for most of building the business, having chosen to focus on higher ed was not cool. The cool kids were doing corporate e-learning. And over and over and over again, we told, why are you in higher ed? It's a small market. Your total addressable market, if you're charging $5,000 for course info times 4,000, I don't know how many people have investors do that math on you, you know, is only that, right. which misses the point of, you know, the 5,000 is not the end price point and the end value prop. Um, you guys should be focusing on corporate e-learning. That's where all the money is, corporations, corporations, corporations. Um, and, and really, we were never the bell of the ball of any investor conference, any banking conference. It was docent and Saba and Skillsoft, mm -hmm. and I don't know if these names, yeah. SmartForce, yeah. you know, ring, ring a bell. But our view, besides just, again, we were young, we only knew higher ed, we couldn't imagine helping Merrill Lynch do corporate training, was, uh, although we did bid on that and we lost, <laughs> um, was, uh, you know, the purpose of higher ed is teaching and learning. Like, if we're gonna be involved in applying the internet to teaching and learning, let's do it at the place where it's not the thing we do to then support the other thing that we do, it is the front office of higher education. And when the dot-com bust happened, a lot of those companies collapsed, mm -hmm. and we had baked ourselves into the mm -hmm. higher ed market and were able to continue to grow. So can you tell us a little bit about the thinking behind intentionally cultivating the Blackboard ecosystem of partners? Because I think that kind of led to some of the acquisition uh, strategy. At what point did you decide you wanted to create mm -hmm. Blackboard Nation, essentially? I think it was always the idea, though, that we were trying to create this operating system for e-learning. Yeah. And that meant doing more than just providing software to the institutions. It meant opening up our APIs and our web mm -hmm. services so that third parties could plug into it like they would an operating system. And then also promoting that technology so that schools could have even a more complete solution beyond what we could provide. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to also build the Blackboard brand and name and make that synonymous with online learning. So 
the next step that you do is you create a partner program and an ecosystem and a support network for all these additional technologies that can be closely tied in with your main product. And yes, that actually led us to having hundreds of partners and then we'd work closely with some of them and say, hey, actually this makes even more sense to bring on, uh, internal to Blackboard and we did a, almost close to 30 acquisitions over our uh, 17 years. 30, that's more than I actually thought. I remember when I was at Blackboard, people would say, oh, you're part of the Borg. You know, Blackboard just buys all their competition. They can't compete, so they buy them. Right. And when the, I thought the Borg compliment was a compliment because I'm a Star Trek <laughs> fan in the beginning, and then I realized that that was actually a negative. Right. I, I didn't, uh... So what, was that part of the acquisition strategy to neutralize no, it wasn't to neutralize, it was that there were some things that we thought were so important to what we were doing that it made sense for us to actually integrate even more closely. Mm -hmm. uh, or we, there was actually just such great talent out there, and you know, we yeah. were looking to grow our company, so yes. it wa they weren't always just technology acquisitions. Yeah. We got some, some great people. Uh, Ed Miller, who's also here in the audience, mm -hmm. uh, we were using Zythos as our uh, file hard drive storage solution, and it was such an integral part of what we were doing, and also their team was so talented you know, that was a, a great natural combination. So and then we did a lot of acquisitions just like that. So most of the things that you acquired, you had a little exposure to yeah. before. Was there anything that didn't fall in that, in that model? Was there anything you just bought right out? I'd say the direct competitors, uh, because, but then we felt like we knew them and yeah. knew the market very the well space. because they were in yeah. the same space. Almost everything, I would say the one exception early on was the Transact system. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And that, uh, the Transact Tell system, everybody. most people know of from the card um, that you use to swipe for the meal plan in the bookstore. And we believed that a big part of being an operating system for education was digital content. Learning applications and content were gonna come onto the platform. And just as the bookstore and that commerce system is what people could use their financial aid mm -hmm. to do that, we needed to have a wallet, a Blackboard wallet. We never branded it that mm -hmm. way. Um, and we did the Transact. But even the competitors, I know people say that, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't really what was driving it. Mm -hmm. What was driving it was always a, a very clear conception of what we were doing, which is we're not building an enterprise application. We're not building, PeopleSoft is more valuable with other schools using PeopleSoft, but PeopleSoft's main value is just PeopleSoft, a Lucy and the same thing. We really believe that the more institutions that were on a common teaching and learning platform, the faster we would accelerate the movement of education to digital, the faster big publishers would create learning applications, um, the faster the administrative systems would open up their data models, mm -hmm. um, the faster all sorts of things, the faster faculty would feel comfortable with teaching and learning, the faster students would have a literacy in it, that we could accelerate the market by getting you know, more and more institutions onto a common teaching and learning platform. Obviously that platform was Blackboard, so it's self-serving yeah. in that sense, but we really did think that the platform was more valuable the more institutions that used it. So acquiring competitors, learning from them, and then getting the mm -hmm. largest market share the fastest mm -hmm. we possibly could yeah. is what opened up the second and third legs to Blackboard's growth mm -hmm. strategy. Would you put alert notification, Michael, in that same bucket? Well, yeah, I mean, I actually, I'd say more similar to, uh, to, to Blackboard Transact. We said, okay, well, look, we're, we're, we're starting to reach a level where mass communications, the institutions is important, not just through email, but through text messaging. And so we were aware of these companies that were primarily in K through 12, but just doing mass communications. We thought that that was actually a key part of the infrastructure that could be beneficial to our platform. Mm -hmm. So we ended up uh, acquiring a, a small business from AT&T and then uh, a couple of the competitors and we became the largest a mass notification system in the U.S. I think we're we in call like two over, years. Yeah, or we, right? we end up calling like over half the households in the U.S. I now receive calls from Blackboard <laughs> when my kids are tardy oh, or absent or a snow day. Yeah, that's funny. And it, it is kind of annoying, actually. So <laughs> those, those but calls. highly valuable. But highly valuable, yes. So I was listening to Reed Hoffman speak um, a, a couple weeks ago, and he talked about blitz scaling. You know, this trend in technology where I want to get his words. Um, investors put huge amounts of capital into small companies to scale very rapidly and to grab a lot of customers. Uh, Say so you think of Uber or Airbnb to really create a huge footprint fast. As I think about what you guys did to create this highly valuable entity, you did it kind of in pieces, in chapters over the course of a decade, right? Yeah. Do you think that this blitz scaling has a place in 
Not really. I mean, it kind of depends what it is you're doing. But the adoption curve of schools and universities has its own logic. And I could hire a thousand sales reps. I may well end up having this argument again a, a little bit. But I could, I could hire a thousand sales reps. There still, there was a adoption. You know, Blackboard was a 10-year overnight success story. Um, these things were very contingent and incremental. And it only seems the way it does now because we're looking back, right? It seems inevitable, but it wasn't at all inevitable. And to be clear, we weren't the first course management system company. Mm -hmm just as we were at the first subscription, so we don't want to overstate these things. But no, I think um, education has its adoption curve. Um, that adoption curve is very rarely measured in two years, three years. It's a longer time frame. Um, and so you, you have to be- you think that won't change? I'm sure there are exceptions to the rule, yeah. but they are notable because there are exceptions to the rule. Yeah. I would say at the least, Blackboard, which is one of the fastest, most widely adopted, to go from no such thing as a course management system mm -hmm. to, you know, I think at the peak, 70% of universities using Blackboard to support teaching and learning. And that peak happened probably at year 10. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine an adoption curve much faster than that. Mm -hmm. um, and I would not describe that as a blitz. Yes, we yeah. raised a lot of capital. Yeah. Yes, we hired the sales team. But it did still start with a group of institutions. Mm -hmm. And then a year later at Educause, a few more people. Yeah and then a few more people, and then a few more people, mm -hmm. until eventually the ones who five years earlier you know, weren't taking our calls mm -hmm. were ready to have that conversation. I mean, that's my experience at Parchment Would as you well. agree, Michael? Yeah, no, I think that describes it very well, except for you should still hire a 1,000 salespeople. <laughs> right. So, uh, Matt, I oftentimes hear you say, I trust Mike. I just trusted Mike. And I think sometimes as people try to create teams, effective teams, they underestimate the importance of that trust. Yes. So do you believe that trust can be cultivated among people who didn't go to college together? Uh, or do you think that the most successful teams are teams where you have this knowledge before you begin that crazy entrepreneurial, risky, scary, et cetera? Like, you say that a lot. You don't even realize it, probably. But oftentimes, when you talk to me about Mike, you're like, I trust Mike. Even when I disagree with Mike, I trust Mike. That's awesome, but it, I don't think it's common. What do, Trusting Mike? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seems very focused on me, uh, Jesse. I just kept saying it out loud, hoping <laughs> that eventually. It would. No. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, if I think back to all the familiar faces that are here at GSV that I work with at Blackboard and that I have a, you know, I don't know, equal level of trust because we do have a unique friendship and, and history together, um, I trust them completely. And they were strangers to me, except mm -hmm. for this story of Blackboard, mm -hmm. right? We ended up working together. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, the parchment leadership team, I would say I feel the exact same way. Part of it is if you don't feel that, you shouldn't be working together. So while yeah. it's never polite to, you know, fire people or have that tough conversation, it is worth its weight in gold to go through the cycles until you, I mean, that was a lot of, this doesn't sound good the way I'm about to say it, but if you imagine each of the leadership team positions are this empty slot, we went through, and then click, it locks in. And we went through, and mm -hmm. click, it locked in. Mm -hmm. And you feel dumb at the time, because why aren't I recruiting and clicking in better and turning over people? But when it clicks in, it's a foundational piece of the team. And these people just, you know, you trust fit. them, and you can build. And they fit, and you can put them in a lot of different places. Yeah. And, and I think that we are incredibly fortunate. We, we got the opportunity to work with such talented individuals. I mean, besides, obviously, uh, Matt. Um, and uh, the, all the, the students from Cornell that joined us, we ended up building such a, a, a great group of people. And I, I think the testament to that is, I mean, God, I mean we, we probably have north of 30 or 40 CEOs of other companies that all came from Blackboard. And, and, and not just that we have 30 or 40 of their CEOs, they're all working with other people from Blackboard. I myself have five ex-Blackboard employees in my uh, current company. Uh, Andrew Rosen, who's CEO of his now uh, third yeah. company, he has multiple Blackboard uh, old employees there. For some reason, Amazon has a bunch of Blackboard employees. So I mean, uh, you, you know, we, we, we continue to stay together and group uh, and, and, and work together. And I think that is a, is a testament to the uh, talent that we had that we were working with, but also the bonds that we formed in, in building this uh, great organization. 
So I want to talk a little bit about leadership now. I think it's something that um, people tend to fall into, but they don't necessarily, especially at early stage companies, they don't intentionally focus on. So we focus on how do you scale your production system, or how do you scale distribution. But I don't know how many young companies talk about how do you scale leadership. How did you guys think about scaling leadership so that it wasn't a constraining factor in your growth? I mean, there's only so much you guys can do. I think one of the things we did well was that we were always actually looking to have new people join the company that could help us not at the stage we were at today, but where we were going to be tomorrow. And that was really a that was really a constant. Um, you know, I always I used to explain to people. Some, some people said to me, I had heard of this, like, oh, you 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 went through so many people on the management team, kind of actually as Matt was saying. I said, oh yeah, but let me explain. My my first person that we hired in sales, our first sales guy, we made him VP of sales. That was great. Then suddenly we had four or five people in sales, and I needed someone who could actually run a small sales team. I was a new VP of sales. And suddenly we had like three teams of people. We need someone who could manage managers of sales, mm -hmm. and so we brought on board a new head of sales. Mm -hmm. And then we had an East Coast and a West mm -hmm. Coast team, and that had a specific uh, you know, skill set, so we brought on board someone that had, you could run a, 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 a nationwide sales force, and then we brought on board someone that could run an international sales force, then we brought on board someone that could help us run a public company that had to really have the sales operations and forecasting down, and then someone that also had experience with channels. So, and yeah, we ended up going through seven heads of sales, but we were always actually looking for the person that could help us get to that next level, and even when we were there, we didn't, we didn't rest on our laurels. We were saying, okay, now what do we need to do to, to get ahead? And I, and I think that always, aiming and hiring for where we wanted the company to be instead of where it was today was, yeah. was one of the things that helped put in place that infrastructure that allowed us to get ahead. Well, two quick things I would add. One is what we talked about earlier, trying to hire athletes, women and men who are just really smart, and we could imagine doing other things beyond their role. But the other comes back to the acquisitions, and I credit Mike for this. When I think about some of the key leaders who built Blackboard, they came in through acquisitions. Mm -hmm. As you know, I'm not a yeller. That, <laughs> probably have yelled like once or twice in my life. Um, but one of the Both very- Both times at me, yeah. actually awkwardly. <laughs> uh, in general, I'm not a yeller with him, <laughs> I'm screaming all the time. Um, but like, one of the very few times I yelled at Blackboard was the first time we acquired a direct competitor. And the attitude among the people who have been at Blackboard is we won, they lost, and na 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 na. It's sort of like the democratic chant at uh, <laughs> you know, passing uh, healthcare. Oh my goodness. Um, and I was furious because Look, I, and I think, again, something we brought is only the paranoid survived. We respected our competition. Yeah. We were scared of them. We paid yeah. attention to why they were winning. Yeah. I'm like, look, we bought them because they're better than us. If you were better than them, we wouldn't have bought them because you would have beaten them in the market, right? And we could wait five more years for you to figure it out, or we could figure out and bring mm -hmm. that talent in. Mm -hmm. So you, you got this narrative completely mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. They're the winners in this conversation, and we're here to learn from them. They have the outside perspective. And so I think of Jessica Frinnefrock, I think of you know, all, all sorts of people. people. It's hard to do it in the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who came in through different acquisitions. And hopefully anyone who ever joined Blackboard through an acquisition would say that, that mm -hmm. I felt like from, almost from day one, I was part of the founding team of the next Blackboard. Yeah. And you know the sky was the limit, and I was given lots of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, Ray Henderson, who Ray was Henderson, the yeah. uh, founder and Angel. CTO of Angel, came mm -hmm. on board, became our president of higher ed. Became my Peter Siegel, also mm -hmm. uh, the Absolutely. head of sales from WebCT, was uh, one of our top executives for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we were very fortunate. We weren't able to not only hire top talent, but bring top talent mm -hmm. in from other companies mm -hmm. as well. So you've been talking around this next question a little bit, and I'd love for you to just to double click on it. How might you describe Blackboard's culture and what elements of that culture did you value so highly that you intentionally tried to bring it forward to your new ventures? I hesitate to say it because I really do think culture is, an, is emergent out of the, the team itself. Um, not top down, but. It's not top yeah, down. Yeah. It really is. But then again, you know, sociologists and me say we probably recruited people who are similar to us in certain ways, and so it kind of goes in both directions. But I think the culture really was this very good mix of, look, we were an aggressive company, so I don't want to pretend otherwise. This was an aggressive company that wanted to go and win and kill the competition, get market share, believed we were the best in every sales pitch. So, but it was also like this, um, and you could guess which of the two of us might fit into that. It was also, you know, an education company. Yeah. 
at orientation, everyone read Rosofsky's The University uh, an owner's manual. He was the dean of faculty at Harvard. Well, I mean, we um, handed it out. I don't know if everyone read this. I made sure they all Michael read. didn't read it. He didn't read it. Um, you know, and I, would, you know in the, and I would try to socialize people to a bunch of key ideas about education, talk education, understand the social organization of universities, understand the roles of conferences mm -hmm. and what we're doing there. So I think it is equally true that we were a genuine mission-oriented education company that believed in the impact of teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. We were also a technology company that was aggressive, believed we had the best product and wanted to win. And so those two things coexisted, I think, in a very, very constructive way. And my mental model of an ed tech entrepreneur is the character Liam Neeson uh, plays in Gangs of New York, the priest, oh um, in the beginning. So the priest has like a cross in one hand and yeah. a sword in the other. And the priest is on the Catholic side and the Protestant side, and they all kill each other. Um, but it's the sword and it's yeah. the sword and the cross. Yeah. It's you have to if you're just a cross education entrepreneur, if you just believe in social change, you're not going to be. This is a business. You're not going to be successful if you don't have Mike on your shoulder telling you to grow sales. You're not going to be successful. Um, but at the same time, if you're just a sword, you're going to bounce. You're going to seem crude, crass. Um, you you're you're, you're not going to connect to education. Yeah. You're not going to attract the mission-oriented yeah. people. Yeah. So you need to have the cross and the sword. And I think our culture was those two things, or the Star David in our cases. What yeah. would you say, Michael? <laughs> Which, by the way, has five points, so it's much more deadly. <laughs> it's more like a ninja thing. Uh, sorry. Okay. Losing half the audience there. <laughs> right. um, How might you describe it, Michael? Uh, look, I, 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 I do believe, though, that the, the leadership team, especially the early founders of the company, helped set the culture of the company. So we were a bunch of people that were passionate about education, uh, passionate about building a business, passionate about what we were doing. And I, I think that, that set the framework for building a, a great company culture. Mm -hmm. So from an um, employee standpoint, I, I might just yeah, we should ask you. How do well, you <laughs> I think that you two are distinctive in the ed tech space for a couple of reasons. Not, not just because of what you accomplished, but in terms of this leadership thing we're talking about. I think that you created a very fine balance between creating a very keen sense of urgency without creating panic. Like, I don't think anybody at Blackboard ever felt like what you were asking us to do was unachievable. It was freaking hard, but it wasn't unachievable. Second thing is, you, you you figured out a way to identify A players quickly, and you were courageous about acting on people that you thought were A players that didn't turn out to be A players. And so if you're one of those people, maybe you feel it's a harsh culture, but for the people who remain, you, the, you had the sense that the organization was continually evolving toward excellence. And it was a little scary, because if the bar keeps going up, oh, you know, well, shoot, maybe I'm not going to end up at that bar. Right. Was that something that you intentionally create, uh, tried to create, that sense of balance between the urgent without really making people feel panicked? Or you really wanted to I don't know. Panicked. I was panicked. So yeah. I think, uh, no, I think uh, we genuinely <laughs> felt, like we never felt like it was inevitable. We, we genuinely felt that the competition Achievable, was always inevitable. a little bit ahead of us yeah. and that we had to have that. We're big believers in always hire to improve the mean which if you're the first two people mathematically means you're the stupidest people in the company. Mm. Uh, just do the math and mm. think about yeah. it. Um, but uh, yeah, no, we, we genuinely never felt comfortable. Mm -hmm. We were never mm -hmm. comfortable. We were always very paranoid. I think one of the things, Michael, that you um, do effectively that I think is a good lesson for a lot of people starting companies is you figured out a way to understand what makes people tick so you knew what individual A players, what made them tick, and so what it meant, what, how it manifested was that you didn't treat everybody the same. You zeroed in on the one or two things. It might have been right. attention, it might have been access, it might, whatever it is, autonomy, whatever it is, and you were able to figure that out really quickly so that the A players stuck with you. Was that something you did intentionally? Uh, I don't know, look, I, I, I'm just a big believer in if you identify who the A players are and then you, you, you let them run. I mean, you know, we, we brought you on board because you had this incredible expertise in K-12 and this knowledge of the industry. So we just wanted you in place to help lead us in that direction. And there were many other people on the leadership team that uh, I felt the same way. Bring on board great people and then just make sure that they are un, uh, uncheckled and can, 
can run and do great things. So let's think about, in our last uh, five minutes, just reflections. So as you think about the LMS marketplace, is there anything in the LMS marketplace that you anticipated would have <coughs> happened that didn't? And why do you think that is? Well, I think there are some things that we talked about in 99 that are now becoming true, or starting maybe a year or two ago. So the flipped classroom, the idea that the classroom is not the center of instruction, it's just one context in which instruction happens. And when you have online, online can actually be the 24-7 learning environment. The classroom can be one context, mm -hmm. study groups, mm -hmm. internships, whatever those other uh, uh, contexts are, um, which I think in many ways, uh, I remember Art Levine talked about sort of star faculty mm -hmm. teaching global audiences, and you think about the MOOC phenomena. Yep. So that's where my curmudgeon sort of, anything you think is five years is probably 20 years uh, in, in higher education. I would say, you know, I do have the benefit of having a little bit of a Rip Van Winkle experience because when I left Blackboard, it was to be an academic. I got my PhD, I taught at ASU. I actually used Blackboard in that context. Um, and then a few years later, got back involved through Parchment. Went to my first Educause and visited all the different learning management system companies. And I would say, and I, I don't want this to come off as, again, because, I don't know, like Just cranky old guy. Yeah. Just an observation. I always believed, again, that, that a learning management system is an operating system for education. The, the learning management system should be the 20% of instructional tools that 80% of the faculty use, like a grade book or mm -hmm. an assessment engine or a discussion board or virtual classroom. But the magic is in the 80% of functionality that only 20% of faculty mm. need because it's specific to their pedagogical approach, it's specific to their discipline, mm. it's specific to how their university is organized in terms of the degree of um, structure in their curriculum, things like that. And I would say that what learning management systems today look very similar to what they did 20 years ago. Why do you think if that? I, if I went in to use Blackboard and Structure, mm -hmm. D2L, I'm immediately comfortable. And maybe that's a good thing because maybe the faculty member hasn't changed much. But when I think about what's happened with mobile, with social, mm -hmm. with algorithms and intelligent data experiences, um, and then when I think about the opportunity to go from focusing on the 80%, the generic tools, to the 20%, that are really going to differentiate and drive mm -hmm. learning outcomes, I would have imagined the typical learning environment would be things that were brought in as opposed to the, thing, the learning management itself. I'm not sure if I'm articulating yeah. this well. Um, and I would say that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And so that is still the challenge mm -hmm. ahead of us, mm -hmm. is how to really turn learning management systems into open platforms that allow faculty or the institution as a curating role mm -hmm. to create very differentiated learning experiences. I think the most differentiated platforms are Minerva and 2U because they're full stack and they need to be able to control it all the way through, whereas more of the quote unquote off the shelf ones mm -hmm. are still yeah. common denominator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so mm -hmm. that would be my answer. So Michael, I have a question for you. So in this day and age, a lot of people are thinking about augmented reality, virtual reality. Do you think there's a place for those technologies in the learning space? Uh, or do you think they're really going to be, you're now at Precision Hawk, I mean, or do you think they're really going to influence technolo technologies outside of education? Well, I, I think uh, it's all about drones. Okay. <laughs> and Precision Hawk is a drone company. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, um, <laughs> um, No, no, I, 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 I do think so. But I think that's going to actually revolutionize every industry, not just education. So I, I think anything that's an improved communications platform that lets people connect in ways that they can't today is going to have an effect. Uh, you know, probably similar to Matt, I would have said, I, I, I would have thought that this would have come up, you know, years ago and it still hasn't hit. So yeah. I, I think we still have some, some way to go. But uh, I, I, I think any kind of advanced communications technology when deployed education can only improve the way that students interact with each other, uh, the instructor, and what they can learn. So let's end on some advice for the young entrepreneurs in the audience. You weren't seeking advice, maybe. You were just, you had an idea and you attacked it. What advice might you have for young entrepreneurs in the ed tech space? Uh, first off, we did seek advice. Um, so one is seek advice, which you obviously did because we're talking to each other. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having like an inner monologue at the moment. Um, <laughs> but um, definitely do it with a co-founder, mm -hmm. the importance of a team. Um, 
And then the pairing of that, know what you're good at, what you're not good at, and have the confidence to let someone else really run with the pieces that you're weak at mm -hmm. and, and trust them. I think, again, that's what made, yeah. you know, we never had a major falling out. Uh, that's not what I heard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, or any of that stuff, yeah. because I think we have very complementary interests yes. and skills. So I would say first order is the team and the complementariness of the team in those lanes that we right. talked about earlier. And Michael? Okay, I, 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 hire salespeople. Yeah, hire salespeople. Sales <laughs> but, but besides that, um, I speak with a lot of entrepreneurs. I try to be very active in the, yeah. in the D.C. Mm -hmm. um, uh, startup community. Mm -hmm. And the biggest piece of advice that I always give to people, it's not just obviously relevant here in education, is if you're doing a, a startup, make sure you're passionate about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, we worked all of the time. And I mean, like, we would get up in the morning, I'd be doing emails, you know, as soon as I awoke from bed on the way into the office. You work all day, into the night, go to dinner, maybe a second dinner meeting, come home, you're working some more. And we were passionate about making a difference in education. We thought, wow, this is something that we could fundamentally leave our mark. We could improve teaching and learning, not just here in the United States, but around the world. I mean, it wasn't just a vision and a, and a mission, but it was truly something that we believed that we were excited to be involved in. And you need that level of interest if you're going to do a startup because it just takes all of your time. Uh, so I always tell people, if you're doing a startup, make sure it's something that you're passionate about, something you believe in, and uh, that's the main reason why I think that we were successful at Blackboard. Well, you guys, it's been an honor to partner with you, and I just think you have created a, a fabulous living legacy that is continuing to inspire generations of entrepreneurs. So please join me in thanking these guys. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you.